It's a, it's a busy morning, isn't it? A lot of good stuff going on. So um, I'm going to let Zach hold this microphone. And so um, we, we're excited that we are welcoming our new youth pastor into Visalia. So Zach, will you uh, introduce yourself and then pass it on to Brooklyn? Like, maybe just talk about um, just something so like uh, likes, favorite uh, interests, hobbies, uh, what kind of food. If, if someone wants to buy a gift card for a particular type of place here in town, where would they buy that to make you super happy? And then we'll talk, and then we, we'll share, have you share a little bit about your call into ministry. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so I'm Zach Nelson. I grew up in the Dallas area, so new to California, excited to be out here. Um, as far as food, um, gift card, like free is probably the best, but outside of that, I think we like Mexican food. We like um, Asian, all types of Asian food, so anything like that would be good. As far as interests, um, I'm, I'm a big sports guy. Um, yeah, unfortunately, Dallas sports fans. So, uh, you know, um, it's kind of a miserable existence as a Cowboys <laughs> fan, but uh, you know, um, God gives us toughest battles to his strongest soldiers, I hear. So. <laughs> and um, I'm Brooklyn. I think, yeah, same with Zach. We, lo- we love pizza, love Asian food, love Mediterranean, so um, anything really. But, um, but I think my interests, I like art journaling. I like doing creative things, so yeah. Good. Tell us about ministry, Zach. Yeah. Tell me about what brought you here and how did youth ministry come the call? Yeah, so my call has kind of been an up and down journey. I first got the call when I was in ninth grade, um, and I was really resistant to that call at first, didn't really want to do it. Um, And then when I accepted my call, I had a very narrow view of what I wanted to do. And I said, all right, I'll accept your call to ministry, but I'm going to do this. Um, I said I was going to be a pastor and I was going to plant churches, and that's what I was going to do. And then my freshman year of college, I started working with youth at a church. um, And then two years later, they called me to be the youth pastor. um, And I felt that was where God was leading me to go. And so I accepted that call, and we had a great four years of ministry in Oklahoma City. Um, And then... At the end of that time, we left, and we thought we were going to go pursue education, Um, and COVID put a pause on that, Um, and then about January, me and Brooklyn kind of came to each other separately and felt like we were really being called back into ministry, Um, and so we applied, and really, it happened very quickly, um, and we're super excited to be here. Um, Yes. Um, We've been... We can talk a lot about harvest, and one of the things that me and Brooklyn truly believe as we come here is that um, the harvest is ripe um, and is ready, especially after this year that we've been coming off of. Um, and we are excited uh, to do the work that God has planned for Visalia with you guys. Um, so, yeah, we couldn't be more excited. We're happy to be a part of your family, and we look forward to uh, get going this summer. So, yeah, thank you guys. Brooklyn, talk about your ministry and where God is calling you. Um, so when I was in the third grade in, um, camp in the building that we called the Tabernacle in West Texas, um, I felt a call to, um, a lifetime of ministry and I really, you know, didn't know exactly what that looked like. And I think throughout the rest of my life, I kind of, um, went back and forth with, um, different passions that I had that I could see God working, um, with me, um, to accomplish, And then um, in college, I studied theology and ministry, and um, I really found, I think my calling is um, working with, like, community um, and the church and bringing that together, so. Good. Thank you, guys. Well, let's pray for the Nelsons. Um, Brooklyn has her family here, so we're going to pray. They're over there somewhere right there, and so... um, Pray for them because they help move them out, and then they're going to say goodbye on Tuesday, and so a uh, long ways away from family. But um, let's, let's pray for the Nelsons. God, I pray for this young couple. Lord, we're grateful for the way that you continue to move and stir in people's hearts and the way you guide them to um, obediently follow you. And uh, we're grateful that they are called to here, to this particular church in this particular town. Lord, we're grateful that you are going to do some great things in them and through them. Lord, may they um, experience you in a powerful way. May they know that they are square in your will. May they, not because things are easy, but because you are with them. 
And so I prayed that they would grow. I pray, Lord, that they would, their marriage would just get stronger and stronger. I pray for the youth in, in this community, in this church, in this town, uh, youth that need Jesus. And so I pray that you would help us to um, work together to reach the, the young people around us, Lord. Be with Zach in Brooklyn. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Now, teenagers can go with Zach in Brooklyn to Sunday school, and uh, you, you are dismissed, the teenagers. Well, God is good all the time. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to a, a wonderful story in John chapter 8, starting at verse 1. And we have been focused on the fruit of the Spirit, uh, attributes that God desires to grow in the life of every Christian that is filled with the Spirit of God. And we see these, this fruit, it's one fruit, many expressions, and it's, only, it's one fruit because it is one Spirit that bears this kind of, this, these characteristics out in your life. And we've talked about, we've talked about love, we've talked about joy, we've talked about peace, we've talked about patience. Remember last week we asked, how patient are you? And this passage about those who live only to please the sinful nature. A lot of times when we say sinful nature, we have in our mind like really bad behavior or real selfish behavior. But sometimes sinful nature is just not being patient, just impatience is sinful nature. And, uh, and so we talked about patience, and we talked about goodness. If you remember last week, we talked about the story of Joseph and how God had called him at a very young age and planted the seed of greatness in his life, but it didn't happen for years and years and years and years later. And he was forced to just wait and be patient. But it's not necessarily, patience isn't just waiting, but it's how we wait. And Joseph was good. He was good. He showed goodness to others while he waited. And so he, patient, he, had, he showed patience, the fruit of patience and the fruit of goodness. Today, we are going to talk about kindness and gentleness. Are you gentle? Are you kind? Kindness brings you to tears when you see unexpected kindness, it moves the human heart. Have you had that lately? I was just reminded of this this morning on my drive to church. Um, I drive on Walnut. And Walnut and Linwood, if you've driven by Walnut and Linwood, there's, um, there was an accident about a month ago, about two months ago maybe. And a young man, 22 years old, lost control of his car, crashed, burnt, died, knocked over a pole, burn up the fence there at the uh, VTEC school. And it was just real tragic. And it, uh, several days after, they had this memorial service kind of right there by that gate, right by that fence. And the fence was destroyed and it was burned and it, was, it just looked like it needed to be replaced. But then they put all these pictures and stories and, and I walked by that. And so I read about this. I know about this guy because I, well, I didn't know him before, but I, I read about this man, this young 22-year-old man that crashed and died. And um, this morning I noticed on my way to church, I noticed that, so all these pictures are on this fence that needed to be replaced. I mean, this fence was in terrible shape. And uh, I noticed this morning on my way to church that someone, maybe the school, VTech or, so, or something like that, replaced the fence and then put the pictures back up. And I, and I cried a little bit. I said, they didn't need to do that. They could have just replaced the fence and left the pictures down. They didn't need to do that. But they did. And that is God. That is the kindness of God. I don't know how, you know, if they believe. But even if they don't believe in Jesus, there is still a, a seed of faith that causes someone to show that kind of kindness to someone that they, they, they probably didn't even know. In fact, someone that ruined their fence. <laughs> That's kindness. We're talking about kindness and gentleness. Paul uses the word that's described here as kindness, Christistos, 
which is um, often described or defined as kind or generous or serviceable or friendly or decent, honest and good. The opposite of this word is wicked, rough, and surly. You know any surly Christians? That's, that's the opposite of being a Christian. He also uses the word to, that is translated um, gentleness as the word is pratis. And it is this word, these gentleness and kindness are very similar. Very, in fact, if you look in the New Testament, sometimes pratis is translated kindness, sometimes it's translated gentleness. It's kind of back and forth. Yet Paul uses two words. I think it emphasizes the fact that he believes that kindness and gentleness is critical for the Christian. That it's critical that we're kind and we're gentle. And like this fruit, this fruit is only possible because God is kind and God is is gentle. Psalms 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. Psalms 25, 8, the Lord is good and does what is right. He shows the proper path to those who go astray. Psalm 69, 16, answer my prayers, O Lord, for your unfailing love is wonderful. Take care for me, for your mercy is plentiful. And Paul believed in kindness and gentleness so much, he writes the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 4, 2, always be humble and gentle. How, how often should we be humble and gentle? Is it always easy to be humble and gentle? Do we get to only be humble and gentle when we feel like we ought to be humble and gentle? No, you need, we need, Christians need to understand that being humble, kind, and gentle is not a product of your feelings but it is a fruit of the Spirit of God that wells up Amen. within you. It is God that makes us humble and gentle. He says, be patient with each other, allowing, making allowances for each other's faults because of your love. He goes on, Ephesians 4, 29 through 33, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the ways you live. Remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind. This is this word, kind, Christostis, to each other, tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. How can we be kind to each other? We consider what Christ has done through his death and his resurrection. God has forgiven us. This passage in John chapter 8 is a, is a powerful story of God's goodness, his kindness, his gentleness. And so turn to verse 1, John chapter 8. Oh, we haven't done this in a while. Go ahead and hold up your Bibles if you have them. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. It is God's holy word, it is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. In John chapter 8, starting verse 1, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, Jesus always drew a crowd, I mean, he, he was such an amazing teacher. A cr- in fact, that, the Pharisees hated that. The religious leaders, those that were getting paid to teach, they, they hated that Jesus drew the crowd, that his popularity was so high, he was such a good teacher, he taught with authority. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. So back, I stand on Sunday mornings when I teach, it's kind of the posture that's been passed on to me. Back then, rabbis would sit when they taught. That was just the posture of a rabbi. They would sit, and people would gather around. Verse 3, as he was speaking, The teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. They could have have approached Jesus privately. They didn't need to make a big scene about it. But no, they put this woman that was caught in the act of adultery, and in order, in order to be found guilty for being caught in, in such sin, there had to be two. The law says you have to add two or more witnesses. All right? So um, they were watching to catch her. 
And a lot of scholars think that probably this was a trap for Jesus, but they had set a trap for her as well before so they could get to Jesus because it's hard to catch two or more witnesses to catch someone in the act of adultery unless there's a, you know, a trap. So they take, they take her and they put her in front of the crowd and then they approach Jesus and they say, teacher, right? This, they, they didn't think he was a teacher, they didn't think he was, they're trying to discredit him. This is like false praise. <laughs> Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? Now, if you want to know where this law comes from, it seems a little harsh, right? To stone a woman that had cheated on her, her husband. The law is found in Deuteronomy 22. You can look at that, but I'll tell you basically what it says. is that It says that if a woman is married and she's caught in the act of adultery, then she should be hung. She is to be hung. This is poo, eye for an eye back there, and man, it was rough. She used to be hung. Now, in Deuteronomy 22, it says that if an engaged woman is caught cheating on her fiancé, then her and the man that she was cheating on with, both the man and the woman, are to be stoned. So you can deduce that this woman was not necessarily married, but she was engaged to be married. And you can also deduce that there is all sorts of um, hypocrisy in that they brought the woman, but not the man. You can also deduce that these men could care less about the law And they could care less about the woman. And they could care less about purity rights. They didn't want to make Israel great again. They just wanted to catch Jesus because they didn't like him. All right. So they bring her to him. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? Six, verse 6 gives us an idea of what's going on. Uh, the narrator of this says, verse 6, they were trying to trap him into saying something that they could use against him. They were always doing that with Jesus. Always trying to trap him. Always trying to get him to say something, do something that ultimately would lead to his death. They wanted to discredit Jesus any way possible. So they're trying to trap him. And Jesus, Jesus was brilliant. Jesus, and story actually reminds me of an Old Testament story. There's an Old Testament story. You've probably heard about it. Uh, it's about this, uh, these two prostitutes that are in a brothel, and the Old Testament's like R-rated. Um, and they both, they both get pregnant. They both have a baby boy, and they are asleep one night, and one of the ladies rolls on top of her little baby boy, suffocates him. He dies, And then what she does is she takes her dead baby's body, replaces it with the live baby, takes the live baby, and it claims this baby is my own. And uh, and a big fight starts when they wake up. The the mom knows this is my baby is the live baby. They get in this argument. They don't know what to do. They go to a king. King Solomon says, okay, we don't have the DNA test yet, right? How do we do this? We're not sure. And he's brilliant. He says, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll split the boy in half. You each will get half of it. And the mom, whose mother, whose son had died, she says, fine. I don't care. Fine. And the mom, whose son is alive, says, no. She can have the boy. And so her mother's heart, her kindness, her gentleness gave evidence that she was, in fact, the mother of the baby. Brilliant. And Solomon's reputation, like, grew. Same with Jesus here. So they go to Jesus. They're trying to trap him. The law of Moses says, verse 5, to Stoner, what do you say? They were trying to get him into some trap. But Jesus stooped down. When, some, when a crowd comes to me and is like up in arms, I get fidgety. I mean, I, I get antsy. I don't know what to do. Jesus, oh, man. He was not influenced by other people. He was influenced by God and God's opinion alone. He didn't get caught up in the rebel. He simply stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. A lot of people speculate. 
what he wrote. We don't know what he wrote. You know, some, I've heard preachers say, he wrote the sins of the men that came and brought her to, you know, I've heard people speculate that. Maybe he wrote a scripture verse. Maybe he wrote something about, you know, Paul, taking the log out of your own eye before you try to take the speck out of someone else's eye. We don't know what he wrote. Maybe, I've thought about this too, maybe he's just trying to get all their eyes off of the woman because she's just so filled with shame. Can you imagine what she must be going through. Here she is being drugged through the streets. She's getting yelled at by these men in a proper religious attire. And she's getting thrown down in front of the rabbi. And she's just, she's a shame. In fact, it made me think of Eve in the garden, naked, hiding. Don't look at me. Don't look at me, God. Don't look at me. Don't. I'm, you know, so filled with shame. And so here, and so maybe he's riding on the ground just to get all the eyes off of her. That sounds about like Jesus. Verse 7, they keep demanding an answer. They're like, tell us what to do. Answer me what we are to do with this lady. And he stood up and he said, and this is the most beautiful thing. He said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again, and he wrote on the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest. The person that's been around the longest, the most mature, the one that they have lots of sin in their life, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. And it speaks, you know, um, they're trying to trap him. And... Uh, and the reason this is a really good trap is because they give him two solutions, two choices, and neither of them are good. And if you think about it, if he chooses, if Jesus chooses to, um, to condemn her, just go ahead and stone her, then um, the crowd would be, they would say, well, he's not compassionate. Here he is preaching about the compassion, love of God, and here he is being cold and calloused to this woman. So if he says, just stone her, that's fine, then the crowd would say, oh, he's not my rabbi. And if he says, you know, who, who cares about the law, the holy law, then the religious authorities would say, he's not truly of God. He's not my rabbi. He's not the Messiah. And so you have two options. It seems like a pretty good trap. Seems like a pretty good trap. In studying for this message, I came across one of the commentaries mentions Aristotle, the great Greek philosopher, Aristotle. And uh, they said this about Aristotle. Aristotle talked a lot about this word pratis, which is translated gentleness. In fact, he says, really, gentleness is the true measure of a man. If a person is like a gentle man, has a lot to say. And he says this word, pratis, is the middle ground between a bad temper and spineless incompetence. It's the middle ground between anger and indifference. And so in this story, it's a perfect picture of this. You've got one group that's angry. Killer, 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 killer. And then he could choose either anger and be a part of this crowd or he could be indifferent to the law of God. You notice Jesus doesn't say, who cares about adultery? They're consenting adults. It's not a big deal, a little sin, no problem. He doesn't condemn her, but he doesn't celebrate sin either. He simply is gentle and kind and good to her. And he alone, of all the people in that crowd, he alone fit the criteria, the standard that he, he put. He said, okay, stoner, 
But I want the person to li- that, that lives without sin to be the first one to cast the stone. Jesus alone fit that criteria. But he chose gentleness. And he points us to a God that is gentle and kind and good. There's a story about Jeff Bezos. Amazon, ever heard of it? It says that when he was 10 years old, he saw a commercial stating that every puff a smoker took on a cigarette shortened his or her life by two minutes. And Jeff was quite a math whiz, and his grandmother smoked. <laughs> so he began adding up how many minutes uh, his grandmother lost to cigarettes. And to his surprise, Jeff's grandmother began crying when he announced that she had lost 16 years of her life. And his grandfather took him aside to talk to him about it. And Jeff's grandfather was not angry. He didn't attempt to punish him. He simply said, you'll learn one day that it's much harder to be kind than to be clever. We celebrate clever. I mean, the world celebrates clever. But God has God has been kind to you. God has been a gentleman to you. And so we share that with others. Lord, help me not to be a surly Christian. (laughs) I thought I'd end this message by telling the story of Carla Faye Tucker. In 1983, Carla and her boyfriend Garrett broke into a a house in Houston in order to case the house uh, with the intent to rob it. And uh, they were both high on drugs. They'd been high on drugs for days. The two ran into the home, and they saw a couple in the home, and they murdered them both uh, gruesomely. It's a true story. You probably maybe have heard of Carla Faye with a hammer and a pickaxe gruesome. They were both caught, and they were both convicted, and they were both received the death sentence. Garrett died in prison. His health was not good. Carla remained on death row. Three months after her imprisonment, she became a Christian. There was a puppet ministry that came into the prisons. She was bored. Everyone was going. She went. She says, I stole a Bible there, not knowing that they were giving them away, and I tucked them in my (laughs) blouse, and I took it back to my room. She said, I read it all night. She said, at three in the morning, she started weeping. And she became overwhelmed with the weight of the reality of what she had done. She said, for the first time, I realized what I had done. She said she began to cry that night for the first time in many years. And she cried out to God. And He saved her. The transformation of Carla's life was tangible. Christ was alive in her. For over 14 years, she became a powerful Christian presence in the prison. In 1995, she married the prison chaplain And they worked together. She was incarcerated. He was free to go. They'd meet in the middle. (laughs) They'd they'd serve inmates. Her life was always gripped by the horror of what she had done. She says, I feel the pain almost every night. And she says, that pain causes me to reach out to Jesus and causes me to love him even more. She knows that a horrible monster, there's only a horrible monster in her that could have made her do that, but Jesus saved her from that monster. 1997, an execution date was set. The media was all over it. Would Texas execute the first woman since the Civil War? It's the big question. Would they kill a woman? January 14, 1998, Carla Fay was interviewed by Larry King on Larry King Live. He tried to exploit the gruesome details of the 1983 murder, and he could not believe that what he saw was anything more than a jailhouse conversion. Perplexed by her positive attitude weeks before her death, King asked, I don't get it. You're going to have to explain that to me a little more. It can't just be God. (laughs) Larry King was an atheist.
Carla Faye responded simply, yes, it can. It's called the joy of the Lord. When pressed to explain her feelings about the impending execution, she said that she was calm and she was peaceful. She hoped the, fam- her, the families of the victims would see her love and forgive her. Her only regret was that she could not continue a life of ministry within the American prison system. On February 3, 1998, in Gainesville, Texas, Texas, Carla Faye Tucker was executed by lethal injection. And her final words spoke of love and forgiveness. Like Carla Faye, this woman never downplayed what she had done. Well, that's not really sin. No, sin separates us from God. But Jesus Christ, who is faithful and just and kind and gentle, saves us, redeems us, heals us. And Jesus, this woman, he says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Go and live in your redeemed state. God has called you to be kind because he is kind. God has called you to be gentle. We're going to sing a song in closing called Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. I want to read just a chorus before we start singing. A chorus says, My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing grace.